Hello everybody, good morning. I'm Adeline Lassrous and I will give you today an overview on transparency and market integrity in, in Europe. Before entering into this presentation, I'd like to update you a bit on FSR agenda on transparency and market integrity. First, we published uh, every year a report assessing the progress uh, made uh, in Europe uh, towards transparent markets. I did the report this year and it has been published last week. Also, every year the Florence School is organizing the Energy Transparency Awards. This uh, award is, uh, is uh, given to a company uh, or an institution for the contribution, for its contribution to transparency of energy markets. The 2013 ETA uh, took place last week in Brussels. And last but not least, this uh, Friday, uh, we organized a workshop on uh, Remit, uh, which data should be reported and, uh, and how, and this will take place in, uh, in Florence this Friday. So the webinar today will focus mainly on, on the report. My outline is first to setting the scene, to recap why transparency is important and how it is implemented in, in Europe. Then we will enter into Remit. Uh, we will uh, explain what is Remit and uh, where we are with the implementation of, uh, of Remit. And the last part, we will focus on the progress uh, made at European level to implement a common platform where the fundamental data for gas and electricity are, are published. So I start first with setting the scene and we start entering in why is transparency needed? To understand why transparency in, is needed, it's good to recap what happened in the energy markets. Here you have basically the supply chain on, for electricity and gas uh, markets. So before um, the market uh, has been opened, uh, this, the industry was fully integrated. It said that one firm was producing, transporting, and uh, dealing with the dispatch and the optimization of the system, then dealing with the distribution of the electricity to the uh, final consumer. All this was done mainly by one firm, one company, so the information was only information flowing within the firm. Then, with uh, the first directive and the following one, we decided to is Europe decided to isolate these uh, monopolies activities, the transmission and distribution part of the system, and introduces co competition at production level, this side, and also at the uh, supply level. So basically, we have new uh, firm entering into the, co in the into the production part, as well on the supply part, only this part is a monopoly. So you can see on this picture, uh, take from effect, uh, the flow of information that is now needed in the liberalized market. That is for electricity, the same thing happened for gas. The question is how transparency is implemented in Europe. So I would like to launch a first poll question to make you uh, participate in the webinar. And I'm launching right now the poll so that you can vote. So here is a question. Uh, according to you, which information is needed in the liberalized energy markets? You have here three possible answers. First, uh, do you think that only transmission and distribution information is important? Or all significant market information? Or the transparency rules should be defined accordingly to the uh, uh, national specificity or to the market design specificity. So I can see you voting. <laughs> so I will wait a bit. Uh, so there is possi different possible answer. Uh, So I can see that no more people is voting. So now I will close the poll and I will share the result with you. So as you can see, many of you have uh, voted for the second, uh, for the second uh, possibilities. Um, so it, I will close this uh, poll question and we will go ahead with the presentation. Indeed, uh, 
when we try to define what is transparency, transparency needs to ensure that market players play with similar and significant market information. So it's not only the information linked to transmission and distribution, but also linked to production, linked to consumption, linked to balancing markets. When it's related to, to integrity, integrity instead ensure that the existing market rules are really enforced with no lie, no abuse, no manipulation, and that is favor, uh, fair trade. So we will see now how the transparency is implemented in Europe. In Europe, transparency rule has been defined in the regulation, uh, so the regulation uh, 714 for, for electricity or 715 for gas, and the uh, coming amendments or the already uh, one, and also in the network codes. But recently, we have also remit, which aim also to uh, to to improve transparency and uh, integrity in in Europe. There is a difference between the rules, transparency rules defined in the regulation 714 or 715 and remit. For instance, remit is more relating to the disclosure of inside information, which is linked to fundamental data, for example, the outage of production or infrastructure, but this, out, this information is coming from inside the, the, the firm. So remit purposes is to have this, this kind of information published. The regulation, for example, for electricity 714, defines all the fundamental data that has to be published. These uh, data not, are not only related to, to production and, uh, and transmission and distribution, it's a whole set of data that has to be defined. This will be implemented, this will be improved soon uh, because there is now a new regulation amending these, uh, re these uh, transparency rules contained in the regulation 714. Uh, and so it has now a mandatory task to develop an EU-wide transparency platform and to, um, to, provide, uh, uh, to, to have this platform also used to provide the inside information. So let's move on now with the second part of the webinar and entering into the remit implementation. I will try to first assess you um, your knowledge on, uh, on Remit. I will launch a second poll question. Here you are. And I want to know for you what is the purpose of Remit. Is it a new regulation to improve transparency, a new regulation aiming to detect and deter market manipulation, or what you don't know what, is, what Remit is about? So I can see you voting. I can see that many people don't know what is Remit, so it's good to attend this webinar. You will know at least the, co the general frame of Remit. Uh, it seems that people stop voting, so I will close the poll and I will share the result with you. <laughs> you will see that is quite... Um, Quite balanced. We have one third uh, saying it's to improve transparency. One third is to uh, detect uh, and uh, deter market manipulation, and one third doesn't know. So we should really enter into Remit now. I hide the poll and I go back on the presentation. So Remit has many purposes exactly to improve transparency and also to deter and detect market manipulation. First of all, I would like to introduce you why Remit was needed in Europe. We have identified that there is a regulatory gap at EU level. What is this regulatory gap? It's that we have the third energy package defining the rules for, uh, on electricity and gas markets. We have the existing market abuse directive, the MAD directive. We have also the MIFID, the Markets in Financial Instrument Directive, which are also in purpose of being reviewed now. And see, we realized that this uh, set of directives we are not covering the energy transactions. So basically, the market abuse and compliance were not defined for the energy markets. And uh, one also specific feature of the electricity market is that mainly uh, the most of the part of the transaction are done uh, bilaterally or over the counter, so are not uh, 
done on organized market and were not really uh, um, monitored. There were some attempts at national level to put in place market oversight, but that was, not, was only done at national level. And we have also some good practices of uh, oversight at a regional level, which was set up by NotPool. But that was not enough to have a full monitoring of the uh, European uh, energy transactions. So REMIT has been adopted by the, at the end of 2011. It's a regulation, so it should be applied directly by all member states. And it introduced a sector-specific framework for monitoring the market uh, in uh, the world's end market and uh, to, with the objective of detecting and deterring market manipulation. We used to say that REMIT is built on three pillars. What are these pillars? The first one is that now uh, REMIT uh, prohibits in to trade on inside information and prohibits market manipulation. That's the first pillar. The second pillar is that now it's a mission of ACER and the NRS to do uh, monitoring and market surveillance. And in order to have this implemented in place, all NRS and ACER has to be granted with the investigation and enforcement power that are needed to do a proper investigation of the market. Here it's a map which uh, we cap all the remit regulation. All these steps are defined in the, in the remit regulation. And we will see quickly, rapidly, how it works. The first step for market participant is to register to one NRS, to the NRS, uh, to the National Regulatory Authority, where he, where he wants. Then, as soon as the market participant is registered, is allowed to trade on market, bilateral market, over the, uh, over the counter market, or organized market. Then, these trades done on markets have to be reported to ACER. The question is, which trade has to be reported? That we will see later on, that is a big question. And then, as soon as the trade has been done, and we know which data has to be reported, the data has to be reported to ACER. ACER is now putting in place uh, a, a framework to collect the data and also a software to analyze, to analyze the data. It is represented here by these uh, smart glasses. Uh, the objective of this software is to detect if the trade, represented here by this apple, is okay or not. In case ACER detects something uh, on the apple, like, okay, this, uh, this trade is not really clear, we have to investigate. So an investigation will be launched and will be done by the National Regulatory Authority. If the National Regulatory Authority really uh, confirm the breaches from the market participant, then this market participant will be punished. In terms of timeline, uh, REMIT is implemented in mainly two phases. The first phase has already started uh, as soon as the regulation entered into force. So by the end of 2011, uh, it is prohibited to trade on inside information and it is also prohibited to manipulate the market. In the first phase, what has been reached also is it was an obligation for ACER to define the registration format, let's say the way the, the, the market participant will be will register to the NRA. Then each NRA has to be granted with the relevant power to implement a remit. That was supposed to be done in June this year. It has been implemented in some member states, not in whole yet. And the second phase will start with the Implementing Act. The Implementing Act is a document that has to be provided by the European Commission. We will discuss that later on because now we have a draft of this Implementing Act. And as soon as this Implementing Act beco becomes a legally binding uh, uh, act, then the second phase of remit will start. Let's say that the market participant will, uh, will have within the three months to formally register to the NRA. And then the data reporting will start as well as the monitoring done by ACER. The question mark is 
when this release starts. Uh, now we have the drafts of the implementing act, but now it should go, uh, it should be approved by the relevant committee, uh, and then it should go to the uh, through the comitology process to become a law. The good question is: Okay, so we know that we are in between two phases. That the phase one is done. The phase two will start soon. Uh, what has been done so far? There is many cooperation and coordination to be set up uh, in the context of REMIT. For instance, uh, National Regulatory Authority and ACER has to co cooperate to have proper monitoring set up. So that has been done, for instance, uh, the way the corporate has been defined in the MOU. The same kind of MOU has been signed with the European Securities of Mark and Markets Authority, which is the financial European uh, agency, we can say. So this, we know, we will see later that there is two types of product in the electricity market. Some are physical, some are financial, and ESMA has, uh, and ESA has to cooperate on that issue. A, an important step also has been reached by ESER through the publication of the guidance to NRS. Here we should be careful, it's a guidance, it's not a guideline, so it's something which is not legally binding. It's really something which aims at helping NRS to understand uh, what is market manipulation, which kind of practices could, could constitute a breach on electricity market. Uh, the last uh, edition has been published in October 2013, so very recently. The idea of this document is really to have something updated uh, as soon as uh, uh, the knowledge of the NRS and ACER is, uh, is growing up. And I want to enter into the core topic of REMIT, which are the data uh, collection. To, to understand better why it's an issue, it's good to come back to the uh, regulatory recaps identified uh, when, uh, when REMIT was, uh, was decided and discussed. Here you have quickly on this matrix a representation on, on the type of product that you can find on electricity markets. So you have uh, physical products and you have also financial products. What has been uh, realized is that only this, what I show here, only this product were, uh, were uh, monitored uh, through the, the MAD and the BFID directive. But all this, which is in the light in red, was not. So the idea of REMIT is to have a full monitoring and to monitor all, all, all the data. ESER has published a recommendation on the data to be recorded, the first one has been published in October 2012. In this recommendation, ACER defined uh, which trade uh, has to be reported and, uh, and, and how. Uh, I mean, the trade, we have different kind of trade. We have standardized one, non-standardized one. Uh, we have also, if you look on organized markets, uh, who has to send the data to ACER? Is it uh, the pro exchanges who will send the trade to, to ACER or is it the market participant who have to do so? So this kind of, um, of document, which are available on ACER website, uh, try to define uh, this uh, data, the way the data will be collected. This recommendation uh, has been completed uh, more recently in March uh, with recommendation on transportation contracts and on balancing. For instance, on balancing, ACER recommend to not collect the data uh, from the start of the implementation of uh, the phase two of REMIT, but to wait on the implementation on the network codes on, on balancing. So, here, an attempt to show you how the data transaction will be reported to ACER and how this data will be shared. So it's a, gra it's a graph from ACER. On the top here, you have basically all type of market participants that has concern by, rem by Remit and who have to report that data to ACER. Then this data will be shared by of course, uh, Electricity and Gas National Regulatory Authority, but also with other uh, regulators, the one for the fine, uh, financial authorities, for competition. 
Um, here we have seen also uh, that there is a strong cooperation implemented between ESMA and ACER and they will share directly the, the data. Now we are entering into the implementing acts. The implementing acts, uh, the first draft has been presented to stakeholders in a workshop organized by the European Commission <clears throat> the 13th October this year. The implementing act aim at defining the reporting arrangement. So it contains, if you look at the implementing act, it contains a list of contracts to be reported. Let's say the long-term contracts, the monthly contracts, the debit contract, but also the intraday contract, etc. And the, uh, the type of contracts, the standardized one, the non-standardized one. Um, and it also details the way this uh, this transaction will be reported uh, to um, to Acer. Here, it was a big concern for some market participants because they are under many different directives. Some are in the process of being reviewed and some market participants were a bit afraid to have a kind of double reporting to do, one to Acer, one to other financial authority, which was time consuming. And the Implementing Act, I guess, answer to that concern this implementing app defines also the frequency and the timing of uh, reporting. It's a, for transactions that are on a yearly basis, when is the right uh, moment to report this data? Same for the daily transaction, when we should report the daily transaction. So that you will know more in the implementing act. Uh, basically, uh, for the reporting of the data, I, I just sum up the well, for all the detail of the data you can look in the in the implementing act. For, for the starting of the reporting, uh, what is recommended by the, the European Commission is to ta start the uh, reporting of standard standard art deal uh, six months after the adoption of the implementing act. Uh, the non-standard act one will start 12 months after the adoption and on balancing the European Commission is following its uh, recommendation to not start yet with the reporting of uh, balancing data. In terms of timeline, uh, so I told you that uh, um, the first draft of the implementing act has been has been presented at the end of October uh, last month. Each uh, stakeholder was supposed were supposed to provide inputted comments to the uh, European Commission. Now the target date is to have these draft rules uh, presented in the committee within the European Commission, which will decide if the text can go, so the committology or not. Uh, based on that, the entry into force is foreseen, is foreseen for the second um, uh, quarter of 2014. So the start of the data reporting will finally start uh, at the end of 2014. So, to conclude quickly on, on remits, uh, many progresses has been, uh, has been made, that is uh, obvious. Uh, now we have uh, finally the draft implementing act uh, by the European Commission. Uh, this uh, implementing act was long to come uh, because uh, I mentioned quickly that there was many other directives which were in the process of being reviewed and we have also still uh, uh, differences in market design which also raised many questions on the data to be reported. I, I mentioned the balancing data. Uh, balancing data, uh, balancing market, it's really real-time market. It's also a market where manipulation could be done. Uh, well, the problem now is, is true that uh, the difference between uh, the national design uh, uh, gives the task to answer a bit difficult because how we, which data, the way we, we report them, the way we use them, it's a, it's a question, but that will be done in a, in a second step. Um, so data collection is really the core of proper monitoring and uh, the availability of the data is still an issue. Uh, we can't say that not all data are available, but most of the time the data, uh, the fundamental data, I mean, they are published on national websites, they are not always in the same template. So when you want to do some cross-border or cross-market analysis, it's a huge 
uh, it's time consuming to, to, to set up the data in the proper way to do analysis. So let's move on uh, to the third part of the webinar. And uh, I started introducing that the data is really a core of, uh, of, uh, of REMIT and uh, still a problem in Europe. So I will update you on the progress done uh, to set up common platform for publication of fundamental data in gas and electricity sectors. I will use mainly electricity example, um, but I will also mention gas. Uh, so for electricity, you will see that it was really a long story to have this kind of platform set up. Um, so basically, the transparency rules for electricity are defined in the Regulation 714. Uh, these rules cover transmission, infrastructure, generation, consumption, balancing. But these rules were not detail, detailed and precise enough. In 2006, a huge work starts by Ergeg. Uh, Ergeg starts, so the, 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 the regulators start working on uh, guidelines for good practices uh, where they try to assess uh, if the requirements for, for transparency were enough or not. Uh, these uh, so you see that it was a long work and this uh, beca became a law uh, this June. We have now a new regulation on submission and publication of data in electricity markets. So I will develop more on that. What is the objective of this regulation? First, to have a common set of data, uh, let's say the same definition uh, for generation, transportation, consumption, and, uh, and balancing. Um, <laughs> and this uh, new regulation foresees that uh, NSOE develop a central information platform available to all market participants. So the idea is really to have more detail and precise definition to have clear and tight rules on timing of publication of the data, let's say when the data has to be on the platform, and of course set up uh, a centralized uh, way uh, of publishing the data. Here you can see very quickly uh, and visually uh, how this new regulation improve uh, or reach the objectives uh, fixed. If you look, if we take the example of generation outages in on the left side you are the way it was defined in the former uh, regulation and here you have now how it is done in the new regulation so you can see that uh, it's really clear clearer more detailed etc this new regulation give important tasks to NSOE and so we will have to set up this uh, transparency platform and now it is mandatory to do so. Uh, people working on uh, transparency and electricity markets know that already there is a platform uh, developed for, for a while on, uh, on, uh, on the NSOA website. But the data are not always available, they are not always in the same template, you don't know exactly the status of the data. So that now is uh, mandatory. Uh, and so we will have also to define, to propose a manual of procedures. This manual of procedure will detail uh, the, the data that has to be submitted. It will also define uh, the way the owners of the data, the CTSO, the data provider and NSOE, how they interact. Um, there is also <coughs> excuse me, uh, a need to, to to define, to describe who is the data providers uh, and what are the criteria these data providers has to fulfill to, to be data providers. As you can imagine, um, there is a huge uh, <laughs> data to collect for, 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 for NSOE. Um, by default, it's the TSO who has to provide the data, but sometimes uh, the TSO are not the owner of the data. If you look for production, for instance, they have to publish information, but they are not the owner of the data. And there is also 
a, a, a serious concern on the number of data providers. So that's why it's important to define some criteria to avoid that each TSO has, and so it is facing uh, more than 200 uh, data providers. And last uh, task for ENSOE is to define a classification of production types. Um, right now, it is not at all harmonized uh, in Europe, especially even between uh, markets uh, belonging to the same regional uh, markets. If you look, for example, RT and ELIA, the way they, they publish uh, information uh, in, in an aggregated uh, way, they don't use the same classification, so it's always difficult to do some uh, uh, cross-comparison. And of course, that uh, should, me, should, be, should be validated by uh, ACER, and also a stakeholder's view uh, should be uh, gathered by ENSOE. Here quickly, a timeline where we are with that. This uh, manual of procedure has been submitted uh, by ENSOE to ACER for having uh, um, uh, feedback from ACER. And I guess the most important target date is that beginning of 2015, the platform will uh, go live. We have something similar uh, for CAS. Uh, the story is a bit different. It started a bit later, uh, in late 2010. There was a proposal from the European Commission to improve the transparency rules. Um, this has been uh, formalized by amendments to the Regulation 715. Uh, these amendments uh, impose to NSOG to develop a single central platform uh, on the cost-efficient basis for sure. And this has been uh, implemented the 1st October 2013. Here, this platform call is called uh, Gasworld. Here you have just a print screen of the, um, of the platform to show you quickly uh, which kind of information you can uh, have on this platform. Uh, you have uh, the name of the operator, you know how the, the allocation mechanism, the capacity allocation mechanism is, uh, and you have also information on the capacity, the level of capacity available, and uh, something which is interesting, you have also the status of the data, you you know if the data is uh, validated, not validated, is temporary one, uh, so it's really uh, convenient. So we arriving at the end of this uh, webinar. I will uh, conclude quickly. Uh, uh, so first we can say that uh, well, I didn't develop that too much today, but you can see the transparency report. Uh, we still have uh, a mix of top-down and bottom-up approach in, in Europe. You have all these uh, mandatory regulations which uh, uh, give some rules on how to improve transparency and market integrity, but you have also some bottom-up approach uh, coming from a private company who try to set up new platforms, very user-friendly, uh, to improve the way the market participants can gather the information. Uh, we have just seen that there, there, there are huge progresses uh, to develop common platform. It already ex exists in gas and it's forthcoming in electricity. One highlight here is for sure the availability and the quality of the data is, uh, is the core issue. Uh, it's really important that uh, the data uploaded on, the, on this platform are the right one. <laughs> and if the data is not, corrected, is not correct, we should know very rapidly why and how to change this data. Remit implementation requires uh, huge work. Uh, we have seen that there is many cooperation, many steps, and we finally entering into the phase two. And we have seen that uh, market design uh, is uh, still the main blocking point. Um, so I Arriving at the end of the webinar, I would be very happy to answer to your question and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Adeline. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, before we'll start the q and I would just like to say that right now on your computer screen, you can see Adeline's email. Uh, therefore, if you won't have enough time to uh, ask your question, you can always contact her after the webinar and ask for clarification or any information uh, regarding the 
uh, transparency and uh, other uh, regulatory uh, issues. Um, I would like to uh, start with uh, with the question regarding the FSR Transparency Award because some participants ask me more details about the winner of today yeah. uh, of this year's um, uh, edition of Transparency Award organized by Florence Co. Regulation. So, if you could, Adeline, just um, explain who is the winner this year and why this institution received this prize this year. Very briefly. Okay, it's true that I didn't say, I just mentioned that there was the ETA last week. So last week, uh, it, uh, the winner was uh, Sismo. Uh, Sismo is an Australian company uh, which has developed an energy monitor platform. This platform is really interesting. Well, the scope of the platform is, uh, is national. It's only on the Australian market, but it provides information on electricity and gas uh, and it provides information on balancing on power exchanges and consumption and production so it's really something that i uh, recommend you to look at is uh, because it's really a good practice <laughs> and uh, you can have uh, information on fsr website huh? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also, just to uh, mention uh, the transparency report, it is also on the FSR website. Later on, when I will be concluding the webinar, I will show where exactly you can find it. Um, and let's go to the question number two. Uh, this is regarding the slide number nine of your presentation, Adeline. So if we could maybe come back to the slide. Nine, you said? Nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly this one. Uh, and the question is, on slide nine, you showed the European framework for transparency, how the network codes will interact, complete <laughs> the current transparency rules. It's a good question. Um, in fact, uh, the network codes aimed at harmonizing the way the grids are operating in Europe. And by doing this harmonization work, uh, we have to define new rules, new way of uh, uh, exchanging information. <clears throat> and basically, uh, this uh, new information needed will not be uh, defined in a new regulation. It will be defined through the network codes. For, for example, uh, here there is a good example in gas. Uh, in gas, uh, there, was, there, there, there was the goal to have a network code on transparency. Finally, it will not be done that way, but the new transparency requirements will be included in the relevant network codes. So uh, now the first uh, network code on capacity allocation mechanism for gas has been uh, is, uh, has been uh, approved for so the comitology process. So it's uh, already a legally binding uh, regulation and within, within this code you have new uh, requirements for transparency rules. I hope it okay. uh, answers the question. Okay, thank you. Next question. Are transparency platforms also supposed to publish inside information? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. But that is all, also already, um, already the case. Uh, you should, uh, for example, on national uh, platform, on national website, you have uh, this, uh, this information when there is an outage on the power plant, this inf information has to be published. Um, and that is, uh, there is a huge discussion between uh, ACER and the ENSO to, to, for, for ACER to have direct access to the, to the platform and to upload very quickly the data. And uh, it's, uh, so, um, the ACER has, uh, ACER has recommended on, uh, so I, uh, on, the, on uh, the recommendation um, uh, on data to be uh, the recommendation on data to be reported, how this uh, inside information should be published, and they really recommend that instead of having this information available on national website, it should be done on the common uh, platform. Okay, thank you. Next question: What are the most important individual market design elements that constitute barriers towards the implementation of remit? But I use the example of uh, of balancing. 
um, because uh, Acer decided not to to go with the collection of balancing data in the first stage, which is relevant because when you work with data, uh, <laughs> you can't imagine the the, the huge uh, disparities uh, between uh, the data. The balancing markets are operated uh, in really different way at national level. And if you want to have uh, uh, proper monitoring done for well, the use of a software which will help you to detect breaches, you have to have the data in uh, more or less the same template to, to, to detect this, uh, this breach. So in, in a way, it's a pity that we can't have access to this balancing data because it's, uh, it could be a strategy for some market participant to cheat on this, uh, on this market. Uh, but uh, it would have been uh, so huge work to, to well, well, I would say almost impossible right now to, to, to have a common frame to detect breaches there. So uh, I guess this, uh, for, for me, these uh, this differences in uh, balancing market design uh, show, for example, a, a huge difficulty to implement a remit and, having, and have a proper monitoring done. Okay, thank you. Next question. According to you, what kind of information should be reported regarding non-standardized contracts? <laughs> um, for a non-standardized contract, I would say it's a bit the same, uh, the same, uh, the same issue. Uh, we are in the, in the process of uh, this uh, non-standard deal uh, uh, represent a huge uh, amount of, uh, of, of the trade, uh, but uh, Acer need to also have to, to have full picture and to uh, do a proper monitoring. They have to have uh, access to this uh, to this standard art, uh, to this non-standard deal. Uh, here the question is also how this uh, standard art deal will be uh, reported to to Acer, which um, I mean, which part of the uh, which parties of the contract will have to to report it, uh, but that is um, is uh, fixed with the um, with the. Um, implementing act and all these uh, questions are very good question uh, because I mentioned as I mentioned before we we organized on Friday uh, a workshop in Florence to to really debate on the on the way these standard these standard standardized deals or non-standardized one will be reported okay thank you I think we have time still for two more questions um, so the question number one will be uh, remit seems to be a big data <laughs> do you think it's managed efficiently <laughs> um, I, I have the feeling that uh, uh, a transparent way of implementing remit has been set up um, it's uh, easy to to follow what uh, what is going on uh, on Remit, even for example for for academic for us for researchers who are uh, a bit in the other side of the of the market of the data. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I have the feeling that uh, Acer is uh, consulting and working closely with uh, with stakeholders. Um, many uh, working group has been set up. Uh, if you look at the minutes of these uh, working groups from time to time, you can understand that the situation is a bit tight, but it's normal. There are many things to discuss. There are many things to harmonize, many flow of information to set up. So uh, the, the fact that it's a long process, I guess it's, uh, it's, it's, it's might be, it's normal. Uh, in one important thing is that you should also think that uh, each more or less mainly all national regulatory authority never did this never done this kind of uh, uh, market uh, oversight so and and even at acer they were like uh, before remit was uh, yeah, was entering into first there was no department dealing with market surveillance and um, so all things are setting up uh, slowly but uh, but are going in the right way i guess 
Okay, thank you. So now we still have time for the last question and it will ask for some clarification. Uh, so the question is, if I understood correctly, you said that the remit entered into force end of 2011 and the full implementation will be done at the end of 2014. Why is it so long <laughs> and how energy markets are monitored in the meantime? Ah, uh, how they are monitored. Uh, so yes, it's a long process, huh? as you can see. Uh, it's uh, it's it's really long, but it was a bit foreseen. Uh, if I I can maybe go back on the on the timeline. Uh, so here you are. Uh, many steps were 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 already needed, and basically when uh, remit enter into force. So when remit enter into force at the end of 2011, we know that, uh, for example, the NRWs will not be granted with the relevant power before June. And uh, this, uh, this, this uh, implementing act was, uh, was long. You, you see how many issues there is to solve, this uh, standardized, non-standardized, uh, which data balancing, how the transmission data will be reported. But there is uh, uh, many things to, to solve. Um, and the question was, uh, is there now a proper monitoring in place? Uh, I would say, Yes and no. Uh, no, because we don't have in place a, a proper uh, way of doing this market monitoring. But in the mean, I mean, not all the relevant data to do it. But for sure, something is in place, uh, and uh, and it is done on a voluntary basis at this stage. Acer is cooperating with uh, market participants and the uh, NRAs uh, on um, on the remit implementation, and the the monitoring which is done now is done with uh, with uh, the the NRAs who are already who have already some staff to do so, and uh, with the data that they are able to collect. So it's not proper monitoring, but it's a, it's a step toward that. And maybe you can also look at the uh, ACER website because they have launched uh, this summer a pilot project. Uh, so I mean, ACER launched a, a pilot project to, uh, to, to really assess the way of doing this monitoring, how to improve it, uh, etc. Thank you very much, Adeline for your presentation and Thanks also for the Q&A. It was a pleasure to host you here Thank at you. FSR webinars. Thank you very much. So I will mute you right now. Okay, Have a nice bye. day. Have a nice Thank day. You. Bye. Muted. Thank you. And now very quickly, I will switch back to my computer screen just to finish um, today's webinar with some final announcements. I think that you can see my presentation right now. Let me just check. Yes, you can. Um, so just uh, the first announcement is that right after I will close our today's webinar, automatically on your computer screen will appear a survey. Um, I would appreciate if you could fill up this very short questionnaire because this will help us to evaluate our today's webinar. And uh, next week you will receive a follow-up email from me uh, with the link where you will be able to find uh, the PDF and the recording of today's webinar. I think that you will receive this email um, around Tuesday or Wednesday next week. This is the website of Florence School of Regulation and uh, when you will go to this website, this is the, this is the address, uh, under the Find Publication section you can find all the publications, all the working papers, policy brief and also the transparency award that Adeline has prepared and she was also presenting some of the results uh, during the webinar. Uh, you can find it here so please use the search engine and if you have any problems with finding the report I will be very happy to also help you with that. And uh, here are the contact details. So if you have any questions regarding the webinars or FSR training, just please contact me directly. And uh, once again, if you have any uh, further questions regarding remit or um, the transparency award, you can contact Adeline directly. And here I would like to also make a personal announcement. Uh, just before Christmas, I will be leaving Florence School of Regulation. So this is my last FSR webinar. I started this project around two years ago and I know that we had a very dedicated audience in, for the, this past two years and I know that many of you participated in almost all of our webinars and you gave a big support to this project. It was a pleasure for me to have you 
uh, here during the webinars and it was a pleasure to disseminate FSR research and FSR activities um, through the webinars. So thank you very much for your support and uh, on behalf of Florence School of Regulation I would like to wish you a very happy holiday time and uh, Merry Christmas and also happy 2014 and I hope that I will see you uh, through webinars or through other e-learning tools or maybe this time in person and some other um, meetings. So thank you very much, have a wonderful day and goodbye. Mm -hmm.